an original MCM production. My perspective to explain what happened in Cuba, since we have the notion of being a nation, is uh, based on the patriarchal power that is part of the nation formation. And it's the way we are now, right now. We have changed some colors and some expressions, but still we are a very machista, macho, patriarchal society. And it's the core, the axis of all the issues I will try to explain since the 17th century to this moment. Don't frighten, I will speak about also little bit examples in certain centuries to speak more about what was happening after 15, 1959 and what is going on now with the challenges that we are facing now in Cuba concerning rights, sexual rights in general and LGBT rights uh, um, specifically speaking. Uh, that's the, uh, this guy with the, this, that's the Cuban flag if you're aware and that's this is a Moro castle with that uh, lighthouse that it looks like a phallus, uh, you know, a penis. <laughs> That's the reason why this marvelous picture is a friend of mine from Los Angeles. He took the idea of masculinity of this guy. He looks tender anyway. So, <laughs> next one. So, let's go back to the 18th century. I call this part the Pedras label and the birth of the nation and sexualities. We have the notion of being Cubans. Uh, in the 19th century, so we are a very young nation. Before that, we were considered Spanish or Spaniards, and we, we were part of the colony, what is overseas territories, although Spain didn't mention as such in the uh, Ultramar, that is the translation, they said they were their lands, and that's all, right? In the world Latin America. So, uh, Pedras was the term from a legal perspective that they had to call people, because the term homosexuality didn't exist in the 18th century. When homosexuality was coined as a term, when? Come on, come on guys, huh? Huh? 18? Right, 1869, brilliant. And it was, it, it was actually put into the medical classifications in 1870, too fast, to control bodies with the merging and development of the capitalism that it was necessary to control on undesirable bodies and sexuality to make them fit in with the new uh, modern societies that were in Western societies were developing at that moment from economical perspective, right? So, one, one example and that's all. Benjamin de Céspedes is a colleague and a medical doctor, uh, published in, in a very famous publication. It was a, 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 actually a medical publication in Cuba during a congress. Uh, this about what it was happening with Pedras in Cuba. He said it was an enormous degradation in human nature that is seeking in Cuban society. And also it was classified as a horrendous vice. And it's very interesting. He said there were so many Pedras in the 19th century in Cuba. But it, they were not Cubans, they were Spaniards that were contaminating, polluting the Cuban society in a way. Because we Cubans sometimes are blaming everyone else of our, our own problems, right? Sometimes. It's something that is on the way sometimes. I criticize that as a Cuban. And this is something he said. Look at that, this is a doctor that is, was speaking at that moment as a, as a sickness, as a disease, as an illness, as a problem. So it was, it was a way of criticizing the social behavior from a medical perspective. It kept the same for many, many years, as you are aware, in the States, everywhere. And we, I will tell you later what happened actually in Cuba. Next one. Also, during the 19th century before this period, we have the war against independence in Cuba. And let me tell you that there were some warriors and very outstanding warriors that were suspicious of being homosexuals. And they said, okay, they are, they are really brave, but they have that problem, that behavior. But when they are in the battlefield, they are like lions fighting. 
But you, this, I, want, I want to point out this example that, is, that, that are on the records because the nation and, and the, the feeling of being a patriot in Cuba is very linked to masculinity and being very macho. And viral or viral, how do you say viral? Viral, right? And this term viral is very, very recurrent in our public discourses on politics in Cuba. Not in the last 20 years, but it used to be during the revolution again. Okay, 1902, US government intervention and the new repu the republic finally. We thought we were gonna be free forever but it was not as such. We had a lot of problems, a lot of racism, a lot of discrimination, and also sexualities that were not fitting in, in, the, in the heteronormative pattern were also excluded and discriminated. And also, it was considered a menace for a neo-colonial nation. Next. Uh, in the 20s and the 30s, this publication that is called La Semana, The Week, was saying and speaking about these men that were wearing this outfit that it, today it could be like um, a transgender person, probably you will see the next one, uh, or someone is wearing this, this fashion was coming from the States and from Europe. And they again was, were blaming this influence that we have for modernities in Cuba, a new nation that it was uh, growing in information, and, and this is something that it was criticized by this uh, article. Pepillitos was for like sissy girls. It could be for you, the term here, more or less. Pepillito became la later in the 90s and 80s in Cuba in the last century to be with fashionable, can I say that, with uh, attires, you know, uh, outfit. Be fashion, it was a pepillo. Look at the reference huh, of language. That moment was a pejorative term, and later was good. Or it looks to be good. Garçona comes from French, that it means garçon, that is boy, and it was for those masculine women. Look at that person, it was, uh, for those people, can you read that from the back side? Okay, it says there, young ladies today, I'm an honor to talk to Mr. Menendez's daughter or Mr. Menendez's son. And look at that, it's very interesting. They're not talking about homosexuality from the concept we are dealing with today. They're talking about gender expressions. And this was the way, even here in the States, there are some very outstanding authors that are saying that at that moment, the problem was no desire as such, was gender expressions. The way homosexuality was used to classify because there was not any difference between gender and, sexu and sexuality. They are not exactly the same, although they are very interconnected, right? And this guy, you cannot say it was actually pretty good. I love the picture. If it is a woman or if it's a man, and who cares anyway, but they care actually, and very, for a bad reason. So next one. It was 1927 actually, publication. And the first debate ever in the Cuban nation that is recorded uh, about this, the left wing feminist Maria Blanca Sala Saloma, and Flora Diaz Parado, she was a doctor, had different opinion about what a lesbian is. Actually, they called that Gersona, lesbian didn't exist as a term. Look, the infertile issue that is related to reproduction, and the, someone who is very macho, being a biological woman or bio woman, is not able to have reproduction because they look like a man. It was a, the way it was conceived at that moment. And it happens today in certain areas, right? And it's rotten of masculinity, uh, she said. And she, uh, Flora Diaz Parral, said something very interesting. I believe it's a sort of transition from the woman fro uh, from uh, 1914 to the woman of the future. She said 1914 because it was the, the First World War. And after the to the two words, there were changes in perception about sexuality, about many things worldwide. I mean, in the Western hemisphere, uh, or, or the Western world. Uh, actually, but what Flora Diaz Parrell said that is very interesting, that she believes is in transition. She believes in a modification of gender expressions. It's, in my opinion, very 
uh, important to highlight that she believes actually that gender is fluid? Probably. I don't know. I don't know. Probably she didn't mean that. But it's a transition of a woman more open to new realities. Right? Next. And the revolution came in 1959. So we are now going into the matter. Let's explain something. In 19, 1959, we had a lot of problems in Cuba concerning a high illiteracy rates, like 25% of the population were illiterate. We have a lot of poorness, a lot of asymmetries concerning economical power. Women were not in public spaces where they were all, all, mainly, they didn't have, they did have had very low participation in politics at that moment. And actually, although we had a feminist movement before that and they had the right to vote since 1935, and the women in Cuba had the right to, to divorce in 1918, and abortion was not illegal in Cuba before the revolution. We were called an abortionist. Can I say that in English? country, and the situation was pretty bad concerning social justice before 1959. The revolution meant a radical change in Cuban life and the way we were building a republic and a nation. A revolution started after 1959, it was no prior to that, and it's not ended yet. It's a process that is continuously changing. Although you might believe at the media here that we are still in the 60s. We are not, fortunately. For many reasons, probably it would be great to be in the 60s in certain issues, but not in this way. <laughs> and then, this is the reason why I speak about new subjectivities and the rainbow nation dream as something uh, to be taken into consideration for the future. Next. Actually, the political situation in Cuba was very complex. We, don't, we, we are not a communist island, let me clarify, put that clear here. We are a poor country in the middle of the Caribbean in a transition to socialism, right? Communism, no one can leave communism before, no one knows what it is. Because it's, there are certain uh, words that are like labels that could be stigmas, and this is one of them. So we actually have this revolutionary conciencia or consciousness of ideas, and the new man that was Che Guevara's ideals of what a communist society should be. Che Guevara never talked about gay men or gender. At that moment, it was impossible. But the idea of the new man was distorted by the politicians and many people with a lot of prejudice. Homosexuality was considered a, a mental disorder at that moment everywhere. And most of the people were rejecting homosexuals at that moment, of course. Today it happens as well. And also, people have the also not only uh, low, low um, literacy, uh, you know, illiteracy, uh, high illiteracy rates, but also well, well not well educated. We have problems with health care. We have a lot of problems at that moment. So the new man perception is not related to being a homosexual, although it was interpreted in a wrong manner. Go on. And this was one of the issues in 1966. This is the official newspaper for the Young Communist League. It's, uh, it's a political organization for the youth. Uh, and, uh, and actually, this guy was the, uh, Miguel Martin was the president of the organization. In a speech in the university, he said that we need to repudiate homosexuality and to become in this crowd in, in, in antisocial individuals. By the way, antisocial is not the same meaning that you have in English. Antisocial is someone like uh, near to be a criminal, undesirable person. How do you call that here? Like freak people, huh? Sorry? Huh? Outlaw. Outlaw? Outlaw. Outlaw? Outlaw. All right, it could be like that. Oh, yeah. I was going to change that later. This is, um, actually, it's the, and they, he also said it was degenerated individuals. This was the, the ideas that they have, and something, an injustice occurred that many homosexuals were fired from the university, and some others 
were prohibited to go into the university to be admitted at the universities. The situation remained more or less the same up to the late 1970s, right? This is something that it was a mistake that we need to study to remember to avoid this to happen again. Hope it won't happen anymore. And he also said that it requires a scientific approach. It's very related, again, to medicine and the control of the body. Next. And also, there were riots. I mean, in the streets, there were uh, a, 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 the police were harassing a lot of people that were probably this guy were not homosexual, but they, this guy, you cannot see it probably because the copy is pretty bad. Uh, it's a newspaper of the, uh, 1968. But this guy were wearing like the influence of the Beatles, the influence of this fashion, and, you know, all the, the, the uh, uh, church and all that was in the 60s. You remember fashion at that moment. And they were considered an, an American, a junkie, that's the way in Cuba is called American in an inspective way, uh, uh, intermission, interference, and they said in the media that they were destroyed because they were sent to jail, because they were molesting people, doing things in the middle of the street. And, and this was, they said, would you like this for your son? And also the newspaper article said that they can provide, they can provide, they could provide a cure for that work, to go to work. And this is part of the, of the cure of, of the healing of these people to be useful to the society. Next. And that's one of the reasons, among others, that the unit, military units to aid production uh, were created. Let me tell you that in Cuba, the military services are compulsory uh, for all men were able to go there. At that moment, there was a lot of belligerence, belligerency between governments, a lot of terrorist attacks. And those who were able to go to the army to get trained, to be trained to, to defend the uh, Cuban nation, were sent to the units. But those who were not able to go were sent to uh, military units on agriculture. Homosexuals were was few of them. Uh, actually, most of them were religious people, people um, unemployed people, unemployed men, and also hippies, rockers, people that were on the street, very alternative people like Pablo Milanes, that is a very recognized uh, singer in Cuba. He went to UMAPS at that moment as well. For gay people, they suffer a lot because some of the guards, they are trying to teach them how to become a man, masculinity in a very hegemonical terms. Some others had fun and they showed themselves uh, they wanted to be, and they have festival recreations, and there are different ideas of what happened in UMAPS. Anyway, it was an injustice of Fidel Castro himself ordered to close the units, because it was not the goal. This was a mistake at the beginning of the revolution, uh, actually, the way uh, UMAPS were created. Although it was helping production, it was not the objective to become behaviors, to, to, to heal someone for a wrong behavior, behavior. Actually, today in Cuba, we have military units to aid production. But this is not the same sense of that. In time of peace, when we are not in the middle of a war, they go to industries and agriculture to produce goods. Goods, is that right to say that? Um, the wine is good for the English, I think. It's, so, next. Um, and Fidel explained that in, during an interview in 2006 to Ignacio Ramone. Cuban army is the uh, uh, Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias, far, far without a C. <laughs> and then, <it's, laughs> yes, just in case, several students, he said there, for those who are behind, several students from the universities and young workers were recruited by the armed forces. Homosexuals and women were not accepted by the army. Today, women are part of the army in, in a very good representation, and they do that in a volunteer way. Uh, most of men, many men go to the army, but it depends if you are marks, what your results in at school. At least you go for a year. Some I didn't go because, well, I could go to the uh, study medicine and all that. I got military training when I was a med student for a few weeks, and that's all. Because all Cubans are trained to 
have a weapons, um, I mean machine guns, everything, just to in case of an invasion. All Cubans, most of Cubans. And he said there was a strong resistance against homosexuals with a significant macho meaning. And afterwards, a few years ago, next, Fidel Castro recognized, that's the way Fidel looks like now. <laughs> yeah, actually, this, this is very proactive and very clear, his mind. This is, this is 80, 87, I guess, was 87, art, you know, 87, 88. It's pretty, pretty old, still writing and very proactive, reading a lot, resting finally, which is a lot of work during many years. And he said that homosexuality, uh, actually he acknowledged it was an injustice what happened in UMAPS. And he accepted all responsibilities. I do, I do not agree with Fidel, actually, it was something else that was going on. It was more than his responsibility. He was the president, but it was not only him. Actually, Fidel had and have a lot of gay, openly gay, or not that openly, but what recognized gay in Cuba. Some of them fought with them with Fidel during the university. And actually, personally, he's not against homosexuality, although he said a lot of wrong things at the beginning that he regrets now. And he recognizes he has changed his idea about that. And he was very concerned about how the society is facing this situation, right? He said he was very busy at that moment in other issues as he was speaking about the 60s. Let me remind you that in the 60s, the situation in the States was, Stonewall was 1969, but before that, and even after that, there was a lot of discrimination against homosexual. Uh, the epicenter was San Francisco. And even some gay Japanese were recruited in concentration camps. Visit the LGBT Museum in San Francisco in the Castro District. So with different colors, homophobia was present everywhere. If we start talking about Latin America, I beg your pardon, it's going to be a big, big, big problem as well. So, but Cuba is always like, if we do something, I don't know what this small island has, but it's something that it, it happens. Next. In my opinion, the worst thing that happened during that period was this issue. It was actually a state homophobia politics uh, on the first, after the first National Congress of Education and Culture. After that year, for a five-year period, teachers and artists were prohibited to uh, perform or to work because they were homosexuals. And one of the issues, this is a very small summary because the... Um, Report is that big, it's like a DSM now. You know what a DSM is, right? It's big. Um, they said it was a, rep the, the homosexual is, um, okay, that's very interesting. Capitalist regime promoted the corruption where their homosexual developed. We were blaming capitalism of homosexuality. And here in the States, the movement was a left wing movement. And the founder of the Matachin Society was a member of the Communist Party in 1950 in California. So something doesn't fit on these ideas. It's, it means that homosexuality at that moment is not related to any ideology. I mean homophobia, the same as homosexuality. And it's, it's a pity that from a left-wing ideals, we had that uh, approach to that. But the conditions were actually what I was just trying to explain since the very beginning of, uh, of my presentation was, it was remember that in 19, 1973, homosexuality was removed from the list of mental disorder by the American Psychiatry Association. So it was still considered a disease by psychiatrists. And still we had treatments to trying to cure homosexuality before 1966. In Cuba, they were forbidden after that. This is, uh, how do you call that? I forgot the term, medical term for that. It's a treatment of just to cure homosexuals. Um, conversion, therapy. conversion therapy, thank you. Um, and then it's, it's something that it was pre pretty a bad moment in our history. There have been a lot of, a few debates, not a lot of them. After that, about what happened there as a mistake. Uh, homosexuals were, um, teachers came back to school, but Actually, repudiation and uh, discrimination still remain during the 80s. Next. But many good things happened in the 70s. The national group of 
on sexual education or sex education was created. In the middle is uh, Vilmes Pinguijua, Mariela, Mariela Castro's mother and former uh, Raul Castro's wife. She was the, the, the principal, the director, uh, the president, sorry, of the uh, women's, uh, Cuban Women's Federation. She was working hardly and, and for, for sexual women's rights in Cuba, and, she, and she, she, they succeeded in a very, very good way for many years, and still they're working on it. And um, she's, this group, after that, many years after that, it was actually 1989, became into what you know probably now as the National Center for Sex Education, and Mariela is the president of this organization. And then uh, the, uh, this was very important because it was part of the policy of the state to speak about sexual education. Next. Publications like Man and Woman in Their Intimacy from the Democratic German Re uh, Republic that year, remember that before Germany, before uh, 1989, they said in that book that homosexuality was not, it's not a disease, but a simple variant of human sexuality it was the 80s, actually, it was pretty good, very revolutionary. I can, I can say that I just, I was a kid, I was a teenager at that moment, I just checked the book to see if I was wrong or right, in many ways. And they also said that homosexuals do not suffer from homosexuality, but rather from society's discrimination and abuse. What about if we talk about our transgender people and gender dysphoria? If we substitute these terms for gender dysphoria, is gender dysphoria the problem or discrimination against trans identities? Open questions. Go move forward. And then the 90s, the 80s came. The 80s were the moment where the country was with a lot of institution, was the golden age of Cuban socialism or the, during the, the best part of the transition concerning economy concerning a lot of uh, welfare from the Cuban society, and also a lot of bureaucracy and other issues were appearing at that moment. Th we also have something wrong that the socialist, uh, the Soviet Union was making a strong impact, imposing a model that never was Russian in Cuba. We are not against the, against the Russian uh, people. We love Russians. Yes, we love them, and actually, but but actually, it was the, the, they didn't they tried to impose that and the, the the implementation of the Soviet model in Cuba, with an Stalinist perspective, was pretty wrong concerning this issue. This was a, one of the aspects that I was speaking in the sixties. I could explain what happened legally when I speak about the law later. Um, Actually, the country had, by the way, just a brief explanation for you, because uh, probably you don't know this. The Soviet Union decriminalized homosexuality in 1919, right? By Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And Joseph Stalin recriminalized it in 1934, and gulags were like concentration, were actually concentration camps where he sent a lot of undesirable people, political enemies, homosexuals, and they were accused because it was illegal. It remained like as such up to 2003, I guess, in, this, in Russia, after, you know, all the presidents and what happened with, uh, with socialism in Russia. So that influence had an impact in the Communist Party in Cuba. That was the main, the most political force, that party that we had after the triumph of the revolution. I forgot to say that in the 60s, but now that I'm talking about Mariel. Mariel Exodus, probably you're aware that we have a, a migratory problem, very bad, some uh, criminals assaulted the Peru embassy and uh, the uh, Cuba uh, government removed all the security guards from the entrance and a lot of people were going into uh, asking or requesting political, uh, how do you say that, asilo? Um, asylum, thank you. Yeah, it's very simple. Political asylum in, in, in um, trying to go to the States. The situation was pretty bad. Um, the, there were conversations between the, the two governments, and people were able to come from Miami with their boats, and people were through the Mariel Harbor were able to go out of Cuba to the United States. Homosexuals, most of them because of the homophobia that they were suffering from left the countries. Some others were pushed to do it. And some others 
besides that situation, decided to be live, remain living in Cuba, and there they are. So we have two yeah, different situations concerning this. Do you know what happened when these people come to the United States? The first generation of migrants from the 1950s were saying that they were the elite, very rich people that came before the revolution or the first period of the revolution, after the revolution triumph, said that Castro, Fidel Castro, were sending the N-word people and faggots to destroy Miami. So the situation was not better here, although they have churches and so supporting groups, and they have they settled down in some communities in south, southwest Miami and in other states because the churches were distributing then. They have medical follow-up, but just checking if they, have, they were or not homosexuals because some people were mimicking their, they were homosexual. Is that right to say that? And they were not. They didn't to go out of the country. Because you say to a policeman, I'm a homo, they say, go to the boat, straightforward. So for you, it's, it's something that happened. It was pretty sad. But actually, you need to be this into a real context of what really happened. And the situation here was not better. Some of them were a very poor community for many years after they came. Probably they found a, a tolerant society in a way of public discourses, but not necessarily in the way to have access to certain rights. So we can discuss about that later. I suggest you a, a book of a, a friend. He's a scholar from, she was born here in the States, and um, that is called Oye Loca. This with that accent, right? <laughs> Oye Loca is the way they call in Cuba like this. Um, she's, she is, is a, a world investigation research about what happened with people, with gay people who uh, left uh, Cuba, Cuba through Marial. These were the poster during the riots against these people that well, they, they were called scam. And also, there is another here that is not very clear, say, uh, Carter, Carter, remember Hiron. Uh, Jimmy Carter, remember Bay of Pigs, right? Also, the, the, the ACE epidemics appear. I will explain later. Uh, this is a, a picture of the sanatorium that still exists in Cuba. And that is a poster of a documentary that speaks about uh, Mavis who said that it was the first uh, male to female transsexual who underwent sex reassignment surgery free of charge in 1988, right? Later, these surgeries were not performed anymore because the crisis of the 90s were harder with the Helms-Burton Act, Tori Shelley Act, and, and the Soviet Union uh, break, breakdown, can I say that? And it was, the economical situation was harder, and then trans people, uh, uh, the healthcare based on hormonal treatment and psychological support and counseling kept, they kept doing this, providing this, but not surgeries anymore. And because of the blockade, we also have problems with hormones. Because some of these hormones at the beginning were provided by American companies, and we could not even buy these hormones and in Europe. This one of them, them is Androcor, OK? Ciproteran for those uh, fem um, female to male transsexuals. This is a, a blockade, the, the effect of testosterone. Next. This is the, how the National Center for Social Education is now. I took my, the picture of myself, the picture. And this is an organization run by the state. It's a governmental organization. It's not only dedicated to uh, promote education or advocacy work for LGBT people, but also about violence, uh, domestic and sexual and gender-based violence, and also to, to work with the uh, providing services counseling and support to children who are and families who, who have children that, that have been victims of uh, uh, sexual sex uh, sexual uh, child abuse also they have gender uh, they work with gender issues with teenagers HIV and STD prevention uh, community work also they work on on, on patern pat uh, paternity and and, and is paternidad and maternidad responsable it's, it's responsible uh, paternity, can I say that? Yeah. And they're working in many, many programs, not only 
on LGBT issues, but because probably Marielle is very famous, and m most of the people might think that it's only because of that. One, briefly about AIDS. The first case was diagnosed in 1985. He was a heterosexual man working in Mozambique uh, with the woman who was in charge of providing care of these soldiers also provided sex uh, you know, services. And she was infected by HIV and this, got, this man got infected, but it was kept in secret at the beginning. It was something that national security of people having, people, although the people were not dying because of AIDS, it was because of malaria. They kept that in secret. Because the first infections here in the, in the States started in the, at the beginning of the 80s, so in Cuba the first case was 1985. Very fastly, the epidemics and the, the weight of transmission was men who had sex with men. I will explain that later, how it's now in 1914. And also, in 1986, the government announces that it was detected in the population in general, without an explanation, but the first Cuban dies of AIDS related to complications. It was in a newspaper on the front page, and this guy was a choreographer that came to New York City, and he was gay. Next. AIDS in Cuba, uh, in, the, in this decade, a lot of uh, developments happening, happened. After two years of the first case was diagnosed, antiretroviral therapy was implemented and was prescribed to all, H to all, all AIDS cases. I'm aware that probably you had a lot, probably no, you had a lot of problems with the Reagan administration here and the FDA policy concerning antiretroviral drugs. Um, and also the mandatory sanatorium policy amendment finished. Actually, this, this, it lasted from 1986 to 1993 because they thought it was like a quarantine, quarantine, yes. uh, you know, approach like any other transmissible disease like malaria, for example, or in any other cholera that you need to isolate people. And they thought they didn't know too much about the virus and the population was rejecting people with HIV. They the first doctors were afraid, frightened to touch people. It happened here, you know, all the, the issue about AIDS. And later, before 1993, they were able to go out. The conditions in the sanatorium was, was and is very good. Some people got infected by themselves because they wanted to have better standards of living inside the sanatorium than outside the sanatorium. There is a movie that is, it, it, talks, it talks about, very, uh, about this. I don't remember the name of the mobile. Okay, next. Men Who Has Men project uh, was created, and Cuba began manufacturing antiretroviral drugs in 2001, and they, it, they are distributed free of charge. Probably we don't have this once a day medication that you have here, or uh, prophylactic treatment that probably uh, you have. We don't have that yet, but still, they are more and more accessible for many people and is in this way. When some medications are lacking, you can find alternative because we are importing a lot of medications from India, Brazil, and other countries. Next. This is an update of the whole epidemic since 1986. I want to highlight that um, the cases that are diseased, this people are, because of AIDS, were only a 16.7% uh, uh, percentage of people, percent of people, of the whole, uh, during the whole, this period, right? 3,652 people, compared to all cases that have been diagnosed, right? This is HIV positive now, and this total cases on, on the top. You understand the uh, slide? The transmission is one of the lowest uh, rates, which is the prevalence, is 0.1 or something like that. Still, we don't know exactly this is an iceberg issue that some of many other epidemics than the main thing, you, you don't see it. You cannot, uh, that's the reason why there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, campaigns trying to increase awareness of the population. Next. And of course, men who have sex with men are the 81% of the epidemics now and in Cuba, and it's increasing. Probably, although being a man who has sex with a man, this is, this is only an um, epidemiological term. It's not an identity, but it speaks about behaviors. I will assume that in Cuba, the behavior of having sex with men is pretty high, right? 
So it's something very notorious. And homophobia is one of the main um, determinants that are increasing this uh, weight of, of, of transmission. And also the macho idea, of, I would not go to the doctor, macho idea and the confirmation of a macho is in denial of everything who is not a macho or which is not a macho, is denying everything. I'm a macho because I'm not a woman, I'm not a gay, and I'm not a child. So I have to be very hard, very uh, brave, uh, and fearless, and this is the perception, the low perception that even gay men or men who have sex with men in general has about this transmission. Next. And what Art said about the, uh, what the UN, this has been possible because of the prenatal HIV testing, HIV testing to sexual partners every three months, they do it, and lifelong combined antiretroviral treatment regardless CD4 count, and also cesarean delivery and breastfeeding is avoided, and prophylactic um, antiretroviral, antiretroviral treatment to the child when it happens. In Cuba, the, the policy now is better in this issue because women have the right to do with their body what they like to do. They're not, this is a violation of human rights and it's a violation of patient's autonomy to say you, don't, you, don't got, you, you shouldn't get pregnant if you're HIV positive. The issue is to work with the mother, with the community, with the partner, and having this follow-up. That's the reason why we succeeded doing this. Next. So prevention is quite important. It includes the counseling services that are very open, free of charge. It could be anonymous, many lines, hotlines is the way you call it. And also education to general population. In the media, it's more and more frequently seen speaking about men who have sex with men. And finally, we as individuals have voice in, on television uh, because they can speak. Before that, in some, you know, issues and sub operas and all that, gay people were not talking. They were like, uh, I don't know, mute. Well, I don't know what happened with them. And after that, the situation and the scripts and it's more, you know, more humane approach concerning this issue uh, and speaking openly and freely about this, uh, about the transmission. Next. Men who have spent, men with, there are a lot of young faces there, they're not that young, <laughs> fine, but my friends they are. <laughs> and actually in 2000, this project started uh, on prevention of HIV. It's the, it's the national network, they go into beaches, they go into the, um, to bars, they go in everywhere, they go into school, providing, um, you know, speeches, workshops, and also, um, condoms. In condoms, Cuba, Cuban, uh, in, in Cuba, the condoms are pretty, pretty cheap. You can buy with few cents, Cuban pesos. I mean, no dollars. One one, one CUC in Cuba is twenty five pesos, and you pay ten cents for a condom. If for you to more or less is the, the meaning. Next. The nineties were very, very uh, special in many ways because of the special period that it was not special at all. It was a crisis, a deep crisis, actually because of what I explained before. And there were two main issues that happened there. The movie Strawberry and Chocolate, uh, this guy here, he's a patriot and this guy is also a patriot. They love, they both love Cuban. He's a communist and he's not a communist. He is gay and he is straight, but they were able to talk and to understand each other. He wanted to have sex with him, and but, but he wanted he, he learned how to respect his ideals and the way he expressed his sexuality. And at the same time, he did it with him, and they were friends at the end of the movie. Probably the, the approach was very heterosexual from our perspective now, but in Cuba it was like a scandal. <laughs> because a lot of, it was 1994, and a lot of people were going to the movies, it was very famous, mainly in the cities. My cousins in the countryside, I come from a rural area, actually said, I do know this faggots uh, movie, things like that. Uh, later they saw that, and more than that probably. And probably they tried something and they really changed their mind. But also trans people were showing more and more 
on the streets and were much more visible, participating in, in public audience. And, and they also have, in Cuba, the, the economical depression was so hard that we didn't have parties, officially speaking. Many restaurants were closed. There were not any bars for heterosexual and anyone. Um, private, private spaces for gay people were appearing in the city. You only paid 10 pesos and you had a party. A pretty, pretty good party, by the way. And actually, more, many of them were far from the city center. It was an underground party, actually, uh, without drugs, no drugs there, or few of them that I, that I know. Well, they smell marijuana sometimes, but it was a few, few times. Um, but actually, the parties were, uh, trans people were showing themselves everywhere, not only in these parties. And also, was, the, the police harassment was increasing against the, this population. Next. After 2000, uh, Senesex was much more famous, showing you know the men who have sex with men that was the first policy to speak about homosexuality by the state in a good sense, in a good way of prevention of helping this population. I think the, the, these are the results of what happened after the year 2000. The, the country was more open to international tourism and a lot of exchanges. The, the John Paul II came to Cuba and he advised us to be open. And I really believe in that in many ways. Uh, and actually it was something that the country was changing in a very good manner. Trans people were on the street and gay people on the beaches. Mikayit is one of the beaches since the 90s actually. And still is, is not actually a gay beach, but you can go there and have a good time with a lot of people. Um, also tra of trans people, lesbian go there and heterosexual families with their kids, dogs and the whole, you know, family. And also religious people from churches just to, they do the ceremonies just trying to attract people from the gay com community to the uh, place. Not necessarily to help us, but actually to show their solidarity, let's say. So, next one. In 2003, my partner Camilo Garcia and I were invited to go to Senesex when Mariela Castro, and we started this project. This was the first web, uh, web page, it's very, you know, <laughs> old fashioned. And that went on in the website, talk, speaking about sexual diversity, although you might think that in Cuba the internet connection is pretty low, we have a very low rate, but a lot of people have the way to have access to information. Uh, emails are very powerful in sharing information. And now, finally, we have Wi-Fi points in many cities, and this is more and more, uh, it's easier, I meant. This, this section was speaking about the uh, families, history. We have like a forum of people. We have also a spa space for friends and many people that engage in a relation because of that and they were appreciating the, the space that we had for them. When the, when the project, fi project finished, everybody was, many people were demanding sending uh, emails because SNSX uh, changed to the web uh, 2.0 uh, and this is technology and then we were, we were very busy in other issues and we weren't doing this anymore. This is uh, one of the pages for the International Day Against Homophobia that I will explain later, but it was part of this uh, process uh, as well. Next. And speaking about um, cyber activism, this on the right, Colin, we have some of the blogs speaking about homosexuality and sexual diversity in Cuba. The most, I will mention Paquito de Cuba is the first one. Paquito de Cuba, uh, he's uh, identified himself as a communist, HIV positive and homosexual. He starts saying, and he's got a son and now he's uh, uh, a teenager and he's very uh, radical and beloved by the, most of the community. He's a very good activist. We are very good friends, as you may know. But he's, he's very proactive. You block him, uh, you, Google, you Google him, Paquito El de Cuba, or Francisco Rodriguez, you will find his web uh, six blog. Negra Cubana tenía que ser, Afrofeminism in Cuba. She's a very proactive feminist. Uh, from from uh, an African and decolonizing approach, and then very radical uh, feminists uh, speaking about racial issues and in intersections between gender, race, and sexual orientation. 
A uh, project to Arcoiris, I will speak about them later, is a, a non-official, not a state-run organization. It's from civil society. They're not legal yet, but they are, the group of activists there, they're not working with the institution, but they unite in certain strategies. They are also members of the International Lesbian and Gay Association. Um, at the same as NSX net, uh, networks. This is my blog, Pro Queer. Uh, that's the name, actually. And I have another one that it was at the beginning of the presentation that is called Homo Sapiens uh, at Cuba in, in Blogspot, and this is in the uh, Cuba Bar. Next. And from SNSX on here, the first group there are, are trans people. The trans pride was dedicated for trans HIV prevention at the beginning, but now it's a broader uh, program that they have, empowering trans population. Trans population in Cuba have a high educational level, but they don't have, in my opinion, a high political profile yet. You get it? So this is what is happening, and I've been training, and we've been exchanging information on human rights perspective, sexual rights with the trans population, because in my opinion, they need more autonomy to uh, move forward with their rights. On the, on the right hand, we have the, 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 the network for young students at the universities, in, regardless of their sexual orientation and gender identity, is Jóvenes por la Diversidad, the group OREMI, Norma Guillar, uh, was here, she was the founder of that group that is called OREMI, that it means in Afro-Cuban language, uh, it could be lesbian or amiga, or friend, female friend. And this group was, I was the founder of Humanidad por la Diversidad, Humanity for Diversity, but it was called at the beginning Men for Diversity. We were 12 men like the Apostles. And <laughs> after, on a human rights approach, I had in my group um, gay men that identify bisexual men and, and heterosexual men. I do not say straight because I'm not twisted. I, I prefer to, I don't know, I'm a little bit afraid about straight. But this Men for Diversity, after the third month started growing and growing. After six months, we, have, we had 40 members, including lesbians, heterosexual women, fathers, I mean parents that were there, gay or not, or lesbian or not, and also in a few amount, trans population. So we were a group that started working on post-identitarian approach, erasing identities and at the same time recognizing singularity of the members and their special needs. It was a little bit a transition to what a queer movement could be. Queer at the beginning of where the queer movement was here in the States, but with a Cuban version, right? Or at least what the queer theory is useful in Cuba. It's not necessarily the same here in the States. Next, a proyecto arcoiris that I mentioned before. They're very radical, very proactive. Okay, the May 17th is the, gate, the date against homophobia and transphobia. Probably, is everybody aware about the date here? No? The, okay, this is the, the date of May 17th, 1990, the World Health Organizations removed homosexuality from the uh, disease uh, list or classifications. And in 2003, organization in France and in Canada, they are fighting to say who was the, the idea, created a date uh, to celebrate the date against homophobia. Cuba started doing it in 2007, and then in 2008, we have a huge event. We have a lot of people dancing in the street that it was similar to your gay pride parade, but it was very political, <laughs> and also dancing conga that is uh, uh, from the eastern part of Cuba, and it's really very, you know, erotic. Yeah, it's pretty good. And then uh, <laughs> there was a lot of people, <laughs> I'm thinking about many, many of my colleagues there in the street. <laughs> and this, this was this year, this, this is my picture, and actually uh, a lot of people, and a lot of heterosexual people, families are coming to the event. A lot of panels, scientific panels, also activists speaking about their experiences, about their demands, a lot of cultural activities, drag, drag queen shows. Uh, there is a place in Havana that is called the Cuban Pavilion, that is like an event, a uh, center, huge, 
and it's always crowded during the World Day. And also they have activities outside Havana in, in many provinces. Next year is going to be in Matanzas because we have, a, we have identified uh, a lot of monitoring, a lot of homophobia in Matanzas with the police officials and so on. Next. So let's go back to the law briefly. In this, from the 17th century, of, of course, as I said, homosexuality was legal. There are a few examples of what happened. The Holy Inquisition uh, sentenced 18 effeminate men to jail in Havana. It was the only implementation of the Holy Inquisition law in Cuba. It's very interesting. But it, these men were not Cubans, were Spanish. They came from Spain. And they were confined to Cayo Puto, O Islas de las Mujeres, Puto and Mujeres, a place for undesirable bodies and sexualities. And this is very interesting. Enriqueta Faber, she, he, was, she, he, again, uh, uh, was uh, uh, um, a doctor for Switzerland. Switzerland. He was a cross-dresser, I suppose, because it was forbidden for women to study medicine at that moment. And he, as Enrique Faber, fought with Napoleon troops. And then he came to Cuba and got married with Juana de Leon in Baracoa. After two years, Juana de Leon discovered that she, he was a, he, a she. It was not Enrique, it was Enriqueta. So big scandal, a trial, and she, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison and exile. Where? New Orleans. And then, <laughs> actually, he, she worked in Mexico as a missionary. He was a, a very good doctor. And actually, I should say that it was, uh, it was actually Enrique Favez, because for me, it was a transgender person. Regardless if, if she, he was lesbian, but this was an expression of transgenderism in general. If, if we have the analysis from our perspective, there is a book on that and a movie as well. Very interesting. Next. Up to 1979, the penal code was more or less the same. In 1979, homosexuality was removed from the penal code, but it remained the same, I mean, persecution for homosexuals, applying the Article 76 and 94, that it was the law of social dangerousness. And to pursue homosexuals. And also in the socialist constitution, marriage is a voluntary and consenting union between a man and a woman and a woman. So this is something uh Bill Mesping uh, Ijua, Mariela's mother, she was uh proposing to include in the constitution marriage is a voluntary and consenting union between two persons. And she was denied this. The lawyer said man and woman, following the Spanish tradition or the international law tradition on these issues. Uh, marriage is something that the state, the state, uh, when the state was formed after the church lost power, this, this was one of the concessions that the state gave to the church, marriage. As a symmetry, as a way of controlling family and controlling and having a legal control of material belongings and goods in, in many ways. And also many other things that lawyer probably will explain brilliantly. I will discuss about that later, maybe. Um, okay, next. In 1987, again, we recriminalized homosexuality. I don't know why, probably because of the, the strong impact from the Soviet Union. And it was considered a public scandal because it was against public decency. It was something very, in 1987 in Cuba, we had a lot of education, a lot of things, but actually this was pretty bad at that moment. Someone was wondering yesterday in Chicago that it was related to AIDS. Probably, that's something very interesting. We could have an, a research on that. I, I don't know why with lawyers at that moment, why they had this, they moved backward concerning this right. And then in 1997, it was absolutely next, removed from the penal code. And also sexual child abuse was equally penalized because before that, if the victim and the perpetrator were of the same sex, it was harder for the perpetrator. Although since many years, the same as happens here, 
most of abusers are heterosexuals. Next. And what is going on now for uh, recently? OK, the labor code or the labor law passed in 2012, but actually it, was, it, it got into force. Is that right to say that? It, it came into force, right, in 2013. And sexual orientation was included as a source of discrimination, as a cause of discrimination. For the first time in our history, it happened something like that. I will explain later why. Gender the, was substituted sex by gender. At the beginning, the bill, the draft was sex. And we, the activists, were sending letters, a lot of movements saying sex is not the way to identify a person from a legal perspective. It's your identity. Only when you are born, you need to have a sex, one or then, or probably more than that, probably, or of being intersex, why not? And then your identity is what really matters, even when it's fluid from a legal perspective. And they put gender, probably thinking in women's rights. I don't know if they were right of what they do it. Or the color of skin substituted race, because race is, it doesn't exist, it's a cultural construction. It's not something natural. And race is a way of racism, in my opinion. And we were also pushing for that, and the, it passed. By the do not pass gender identity, set HIV set of status, gender speech, and violence at the workplace. That is like um, bullying that you have at school, but at the workplace. That is something that is happening in Cuba as well. Next. The advocacy work about the network and the activists OK, the Cuban government position changed concerning sexual orientation at the UN system. Activists were pretty involved, and we were protesting when they voted uh, favoring the African and the Middle East and Asian countries that are criminalizing homosexuality. And it's very interesting that our government changed this perspective before, many years before, in the UN system before what, what they did actually inside the country. But this is part uh, of the, of the uh, advocacy work, and it really worked. The Ministry of Health resolution was issued on transsexual health care in, uh, in 2008, saying, stating that it should be provided by professionals specialized in this issue, free of charge, universal, and absolutely accessible. And it was also a little bit problematic of the uh, people, but it was not a big deal. And high officials are pretty aware of the situation that is necessary. Now we are fighting against pathologization to keep these services for free, universal, and accessible, but also to have a modification of the law to provide access to trans people to have the autonomy to transform their bodies the way they like to and the recognition of their legal identity, regardless if they underwent or not sexual uh, sex reassignment surgery, any of this kind. Of, and also recognition of sexual orientation, in my opinion, was one of the most important issues by the Communist Party as a source of discrimination in 2010. It was quite important. I think it was, um, a, they were showing a justice approach to this issue after many years with a different approach. It doesn't mean that within the Communist Party still we don't have discrimination. But it's stated that it's not legal. And also, as a result of this process, I present to you Adela. I kind of want to introduce her here with the pink. It's, it's her. Um, Adela is a council woman. It's the way you call it in the States, right? And she was elected. She was uh, the nomination was made was made by a member of the Communist Party in a very small community in Caibarien in the Villa Clara province in the central part of the island. And Adela was in jail in the 1980s for being a homosexual. Her father accused her, and she was sent to jail. He identified she identified himself as a homosexual, but 
she is a transgender person because she's, the gender expressions, probably his identity is not female, but the gender expressions are as such. And she's working in a, in a polyclinic, you know, small clinic uh, as um, ECG technician, or e, you say e, e, EKG technician, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, the, um, at the community, and she was re-elected recently. She's, she says she wanna be a congresswoman. And I think she's gonna succeed. She's very powerful, and she's a very good speaking as she's a real political woman. Next. What is pending? Okay, the family code that is the, uh, the, the, um, the law about family in Cuba that it was um, issued in, in, in 1975 was very revolutionary at that moment, but now it's very, very conservative, in my opinion. We, we are asking the recognition of gender diversity within the family, same-sex partners, patrimonial rights, marriage, including adoption, that it was not accepted in the, in the first bill I've, I had access to. I don't know how the bill is now, and no one knows what is going to be discussed. It's like a top secret information. And also reconfiguration of the family model. I've been one of the advocates for including three members of more in, in a family more than two members of this binary approach. In Cuba, we have several examples of people, three people living together with erotical relationships. That is called in Spanish, trieja. What do you call, menage a trois? No, what do you call? Threesome. Threesome, that is when you're having sex. Huh? <laughs> That's, what, That's what I've learned here, actually. <laughs> uh, polyamory. Oh, yeah, polyamory, yeah. It could be like that, but actually it could be included as well to cover most of the situation as this is, is very radical for many people, but that's what it is. And also the gender identity bill I was explaining before. Next. So challenges, and this is the, one of the last slides is a summary. The legal recognition of non-heteronormative uh, sexualities, implementation of the national program on sex education with no gender binary approach, Strengthening the advocacy groups for sexual rights, including non-institutional organizations. And quite important is the intersectional approach against all discrimination, racial, ethnicity, religious, gender, and so on. Uh, in my opinion, this is quite important because the way we are making politics in Cuba should be made in a horizontal approach based on participation, political, plenty political participation as is stated in our constitution. Still we have a very vertical country in the way we are making politics. Although we are consulted, although we offer a lot of information and we did it with some of the recent law, with Raul Castro the situation is changing progressively for a good, in a good way, but we need to participate more also when the law is not working to make proposals and to have a flexible way of changing laws. And other way of participating that is necessary, and we had very, very good examples at the beginning of the, of the 1960s. So we hope we, we should have, we have in the future next, a better country, as our national hero said, based on his ideals, when he said that everything that divides men, he was speaking about racism at that moment, but he said everything that divides men, everything that specifies, separates, or pains them is a sin against humanity. Thank you very much. An MCM production.